Here we go. Open your Bibles tonight to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Now, as often is true with Scripture, we're going to be introduced to new names and characters in our chapter tonight, and yet we're not going to have any real identifying feature that tells us we have advanced in time, and we have simply skipped over a series of years in our text tonight without really any mention other than the transition of the players, so to speak. At this point in time, in Daniel chapter 5, the 43-year reign of Nebuchadnezzar has come to an end, and he has died in 562 B.C. Now, there are rather interesting things that are uh, throughout the ages have been challenges concerning the book of Daniel, including the chapter before us. And that would also include that there is no mention in secular records of a man who we're going to be introduced to tonight. Many times uh, he's called Belshazzar. Uh, I will call him Belshazzar, as uh, that is actually the pronunciation of his name. And uh, he is introduced into the text, and there are some who say there's simply no record of such a king over Babylon until the Babylonian chronicles were found, which we mentioned a few weeks ago, that are housed in the Museum of London. And he indeed is found to be a character uh, within the Babylonian Empire. We'll explain more about exactly who he is and his role. Now, the Babylonian Chronicles at this time, as well as 2 Kings 25 and Jeremiah 52, as well as other secular historians, tell us that at Nebuchadnezzar's death, his son, Evil Merodic, boy, is that a name, Evil Merodic, had reigned for two years in his place and has now been assassinated. We know, know also there was a parade of Nebuchadnezzar's relatives that went through the office, had brief stints on the throne, and each of them met the same fate as evil Merodic. They died after a short time. Now, history tells us, along with the support of some 10,000 Babylonian tablets, that a man named Nabonidus was actually the one who ascended to the throne. Now, he was not a relative of Nebuchadnezzar's, but rather he married one of his widowed daughters who had a son whose name was Belshazzar, and we will be introduced to him tonight. Now, we also know that Nabonidus, though he was actually king over Babylon for 17 years, he spent 14 of those 17 years ruling away from the city of Babylon itself. And he lived in the region of Tamar, which was in the middle of the Arabian desert. And therefore, as he lived miles from the city of Babylon, he left his stepson, Belshazzar, as co-regent over the kingdom of Babylon. And we'll find this underscored for us when we come across a mention of Belshazzar offering to his lords or Daniel the role of being third in the kingdom. He couldn't offer being second in the kingdom because he was second in the kingdom to Nabonidus. So he offered the role of being third in the kingdom. Now at this point in time, the Medes, who are the modern day Kurds, as well as the Persians, who are the modern day Iranians, were a united kingdom that was warring against the kingdom of Babylon. Now, if you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream or a vision of a statue that had medals that were uh, decreasing in value that uh, implied inferior kingdoms were going to replace the kingdoms in successive order. And Daniel 2.32 spoke of the image's head, which was of fine gold, that representing Babylon, yet its chest and arms of silver and its belly and thighs of bronze. And the statue goes down through the legs and the feet and toes as we studied back then. And we are now moving downward in the image of the vision or dream in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream, that is, in Daniel chapter 2. And this inferior kingdom that is now replacing Babylon is indeed the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, at the time of the events of Daniel chapter 5, the armies of Cyrus, King Cyrus, over the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, had made their way to the city of Babylon. The city at this point in time had been under siege for three months. All import of goods had been cut off as well as any supplies or traffic coming into the city. 
Now, Herodotus, the 4th century Greek historian, 4th century BC, that is, told us that the Medes and the Persians outside the city, were outside the city in the night on which Belshazzar had his feast. Now, the night we know from history has been marked as the 16th of Tishri, and that would coincide with October 11th or 12th, 539 BC by our calendar. So there's a date stamp for us. Now, we also need to remember as we see the overthrow of Babylon that Babylon was a 15-mile cube. It was surrounded by walls 87 feet thick, 350 feet high, with a tower 100 feet higher than that on each of the four walls of the city. Historians tell us the city had at this point a two-year food supply on hand within its walls and the ability to sustain itself as it grew more crops because it enjoyed an endless water supply as the Euphrates River ran right through the heart of the city diagonally under the massive walls. And therefore, for all intents and purposes, Babylon not only was the golden and beautiful city, it was impenetrable or unconquerable, if you will. So here's the scene. It is an evening in 539 BC. And unbeknownst to Belshazzar, his stepfather Nabonidus was now a prisoner of the Medo-Persians. And the armies of Babylon had already been defeated at this point in time. And the city was surrounded by the invading army for over three months. So what does Belshazzar do? As a good king, of course, he makes the wise decision with the city surrounded by armies to throw a party. Does that make any sense? No, and much else that we read won't make any sense either. And the fact is, he thinks he'll never get past the walls of the city. He, most of all, was so impressed with the city, even as Nebuchadnezzar was before he came to the end of himself, where he thought he was so confident in uh, the city walls and the fact that they were uh, able to sustain themselves. He didn't need to worry about the Medo-Persian army pressing in around them. Now, Isaiah 5, 11, and 12 is a good reminder for us as we dig into our text, which says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. And this is what happened with Belshazzar. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute, and the wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Now, have you ever met somebody that was described as an accident looking for a place to happen? Have you ever run into one of those kind of people? Well, this is kind of who Belshazzar is. Or maybe you've known somebody that you care for who makes decisions they would later regret or have great consequences in their life. And you watching this happen and unfold felt powerless to do anything about it. And you couldn't convince them to stop their destructive behavior. And this is what is happening actually in our text. And what we are about to witness is not simply the death of a person. We're about to witness the death of an empire. Now, we could very well, because of those two things, title our time together tonight, How to Destroy Yourself, or we could call it How to Ruin Your Country. But we're going to look at it from the positive aspect and the opposite perspective. And our topic and title tonight is very timely for all of us here as uh, God-fearing Americans. And our title is just this, How to Save a Nation. Our title tonight is How to Save a Nation. Now we're going to examine a single man who was the head of the world's greatest empire. And we can look at his actions and by them conclude that if what he did destroyed him and destroyed the city of Babylon, if we do the opposite, then we have the potential to save our nation or any nation for that matter. Now Psalm 9-7 also says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now, I believe our nation is experiencing a respite at this point in time from the moral and spiritual slide that we had been experiencing. But I also know that scripture says very clearly that we are going to continue the downgrade, so to speak. And someday 
the good old US of A, whatever form that may be at that given time, is going to turn its back on the nation of Israel because Zechariah prophesies all nations will be unified against Israel. Now in Acts 3.19, we're also told to repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I wanted to include that because the word refreshing can also be translated as recovery. And therefore, I don't believe that we need to throw in the towel on the United States of America. I believe God can do a good work here once again before he comes for his church, amen? I believe that there can be a revival in our country. And that means that tonight we're going to find through Belshazzar's actions that destroy his nation, we can learn actually how to recover ours. So let's learn together how to save a nation tonight by learning what to avoid in order to avert the destruction of our great country as long as we possibly can. Well, we're going to break our text down into five sections. Our first reading will be one through three of Daniel 5. So would you stand and honor the word of God? And read along with me, please. Daniel chapter 3, or 5 rather, verses 1 through 3. And listen, if you want to say Belshazzar, go for it. Verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. You may be seated. Now one thing to note, we're told here that his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken these vessels from the house of God. Two things to note. Remember our text is written in Aramaic at this time and there is no word in Chaldean or Aramaic nor is there a word in Hebrew for grandfather or stepfather. So when you see the word father it would simply include any ancestor. It could be your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, but father would be the appropriate word to use for Nebuchadnezzar, even though it wasn't his uh, birth father, so to speak. Now, archaeologists have uncovered within the ruins of Babylon multiple banquet halls, each easily capable of seating 10,000 people. Now, that tells us that the group that was gathered here was not limited to simply a thousand of Belshazzar's lords, but it was also people that they would have invited themselves most likely. Now, this great feast that was thrown also gives us some other information or interesting information or possibilities by what is not mentioned here. There are multitudes of records from Babylon that tell us this wasn't a feast as we would think of it, This was an orgy that was taking place. And what happened there was so debased and sexually perverse that the activities that took place are not even appropriate to speak of by any respectable person. But I think we all well understand what an orgy would uh, be representative of. Now this was drunkenness and sexual perversion at its worst. Now we know that when Nebuchadnezzar conquered and destroyed Jerusalem that he carried off the gold and silver implements of worship from the temple. We also know that he put them in the temple of his God, his God being Marduk, uh, who is also the same as Bel. And uh, interesting, we have Belshazzar, and his name actually means Bel will protect the king. So he had confidence in his non-existent deity, and that was part of why uh, the actions we see here. Now this event takes place some 70 years after Nebuchadnezzar had plundered the temple and carried away the vessels used for worship into the temple of Marduk. And Belshazzar calls for them, in essence, to raise the bar in his efforts to humiliate the God of the Jews by drinking from them in the midst of all this drunken perversion. Now all this partying and debauchery is going on with the Medo-Persian army outside the walls of the city. And Belshazzar seems to be so confident, he's comfortable with blaspheming the God of Daniel, even knowing the army 
is outside the city. Now this brings us to our first phase of how to save a nation. And we'll look at again, the opposite of what's happening in our text as a way for our country uh, to be recovered, so to speak. Now the, here's the first thing I want you to take note of tonight. If we're going to see our country turn around, here's the first thing that has to happen. Do not provoke fleshly desires or pleasures over moral purity. Do not promote fleshly pleasures over moral purity. Is not pleasure what people worship today? Are they not living for themselves today and expressing themselves in any way that they may choose to do today? I was in a, uh, stopped on my way out to the Bible college that I was, I was uh, teaching at on Monday uh, to grab a drink on my way out there and use the uh, restroom after the uh, 115 mile drive. And, um, you know, I walked to the bathroom and it said, any gender bathroom. Both bathrooms, just any gender or all gender bathroom is what it said. We can't even say men and women anymore. And this is what our country is turning into. And whether it's national or personal, when both the expression and the pursuit of pleasure becomes disproportionate, it begins the process of destroying a once great nation. Now think about Hebrews eleven twenty four to 26, where we're told of Moses, who by faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And again, Hebrews makes a connection between treasure and pleasure, and pleasure was a treasure in Egypt. And it was true right before it fell into its own disaster in the form of the 10 plagues. Now, I think we all recognize that the Christian life, if you're going to really live the Christian life for real, it's just a boring drag and we don't ever have any fun, right? Hardly, the opposite is true. There's no better life than the Christian life, amen? And fun is not off limits if you are a child of God. We also know that Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20, Solomon says, here's what I've seen. It's good and fitting for one to eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him. For it is his heritage as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him the power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Listen, life is awesome as a Christian, amen? Life is wonderful as a person of God to live and serve and work for his namesake and glory and do all that we do no matter what it is unto his great name. Now God wants us to enjoy life. Solomon says it is the gift of God. However, when the pursuit of pleasure becomes perverted or disproportionate, a path of destruction has been embarked on, be that personally or nationally. And saving a nation or averting its destruction starts here, by not promoting fleshly pleasures over moral Purity. God wants us to be a holy people. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, Psalm 33, 12 tells us, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Somebody say, amen. Take a look at four through nine, as we've got a whole chapter to cover tonight, so we'll move rather quickly. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, the color of royalty, and have a chain of gold around his neck. That's a Mr. T starter kit, a nice big uh, gold chain. And he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its 
interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. Now, interesting that archaeological digs in Babylon have revealed that these huge banquet halls that had the capacity or seating capacity of up to 10,000 had an inset section on one end of each great hall. Now there's also some evidence that this area that was elevated above the rest of the hall was where the king sat and lamps were set in order to cast light on the king as he was seated above all the rest of those who were his guests. He sat in a lighted cutout inside the wall of the hall. Now therefore picture this scene in your mind's eye. The king is seated with a spotlight on him. And the hand writes on the wall over the king's head for the whole auditorium to see. Now, interesting, in light of these verses, here is Belshazzar seated above all the people, viewing the debauchery that was raging before him. This hand writes on the wall, and his lords and others not only see the king in his place, they see the king for who he really is. His countenance changes. He freaks out. His knees are knocking in fear. And verse 7 says he cried for the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers to be brought to him. And the word cried actually means he shrieked. He screamed like a little girl. We may understand it to me. Now Nahum 2, 9 and 10 tells us, Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. This is exactly what happened with Belshazzar. He was worshiping the gods of gold and silver. The color drained from his face. His knees knocked together when a hand wrote on the wall. Now that reminds us that the Lord is not going to allow the worship of pleasure and treasure to replace him. He wants no other gods, no other objects of worship before him. He will take first place and no other in anyone's lives. Amen? And this man is so arrogant that he throws a party with the enemy camped outside the city walls and yet he's brought to a place of such fear his own legs betrayed him and he couldn't even stand up in front of his own people because of the great fear. Yet, what does he do? He sends for the occultist and the pagans to give him answers and offers him even a position of third rank in the kingdom. And that tells us that he assumed that what he was after could be bought or acquired for the right price. Now clearly we see the connection between the challenging of the God of the Jews and the hand that wrote on the wall being obvious. But think about what happened here. There was no response from Belshazzar or any of his lords like, maybe we ought to put this stuff back. Maybe we shouldn't be drinking out of this. There's none of that as a response by the king or anyone else. Nobody says, hey, what we're doing is wrong. But they turn strictly to worldly means for answers. Now what this translates into as it pertains to our second aspect of how to save a nation is simply this. Listen, if our country is going to turn around and fully recover and enjoy the benefits and blessings that we have for so much of our history, it's going to take this. Here's the second observation. Recognize the Bible as the only absolute moral authority. If our country is going to recover, it must recognize the Bible as the only absolute moral authority. We cannot be looking to worldly things. We cannot be looking to occultic practices. And I think most of us readily recognize that people in our country today are willing to worship just about anything other than God. People will recognize and trust in other deities. They will promote other religious writings. They will trust in all sorts of religious practices. They will defend the rights of every religion except for one. And that is the one that says Jehovah God is the only God and the true and living God and there is no other. The only one people won't tolerate today is the one that says it is, the God, uh, it is God who has made us 
And every person does not have the right to define their own life and morality. And, and the God of the Bible expects us to, to live in a manner that is pleasing to him. And listen, whether in our country, whether in our time, or any other country or time, when pleasure is worship and righteousness is forsaken, the rejection of any sense of moral absolutes or divine authority is going to follow. And that's what we see has happened in our own country. After all, Romans 1, 18 and 19 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be made known of God is manifest to them for God has shown it to them. Listen, yes, God wants us to enjoy life. Amen? Yes, we are to enjoy life, enjoy the work of our own hands, but he also preserves the right, or reserves the right to define the acceptable pursuit of pleasure according to his word and precepts. And he has done so in what we call the Bible. And when pleasure becomes king, a rejection of God's right to define right and wrong is soon going to follow, both personally and then nationally. And if our nation is going to be saved from the fate of Babylon or even later Rome, then the Bible and God's authority must be recognized and revered. Amen? Look at 10 to 16 as we keep moving. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I've heard of you, and you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom." Now, again, the queen is unlikely Belshazzar's wife. Most likely, this is Nebuchadnezzar's widow or one that we might call the queen mum, so to speak. Now, after this guy totally loses it in front of his subordinates, the queen comes in and says, O king, live forever. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. Now, you have to wonder if there wasn't a little bit of get a hold of yourself, man in these words from the queen. And she reminds Belshazzar of Daniel's role in the past with his grandfather and that he could give the interpretation for him. Now, notice also that the queen brings up the sanctified life that Daniel had lived all the years in the captivity. Remembering all the way back in chapter one, he refused to eat of the king's delicacies. Next week we'll find that he refused to bow to the instructions of the satraps who were trying to capture him and wound up in the lion's den because of it. And yet God was faithful to him there. He refused to bow to the king's image and he isn't here or present at this party either. He had to be sent for. Now, I think this is important to highlight because what it tells us is that Daniel didn't have this attitude that many have today that we have to be like the world in order to reach the world. No, we're not to be anything like the world. We're to come out from the world and be separate, says the Lord, and not touch what is unclean. Somebody say, amen. amen. 
I was thinking back to years ago, the first time when I taught through the book of Daniel, one of the points that we made or points of observation has always stuck with me about Daniel. And it was simply this, where sin was going to abound, Daniel was not to be found. He wasn't at this party, even though he had long ago been appointed head of the Lords by Nebuchadnezzar. And when sin was going to be abounding around him, Daniel was somewhere else. Now, I think this is part of the formula for personal spiritual greatness and even saving a nation. Now, Belshazzar, whether or not he actually knew Daniel outside of what the queen said, it's pretty likely that he knew of him. Yet he asked him, are you that Daniel? Are you the one of the captives? And he, I do believe, is asserting his authority over here and reminding Daniel, listen, you work for me. You're one of the slaves that we conquered and brought here against your will. Are you the one that can interpret dreams and enigmas? And the word enigma simply means a dark saying or a hard question or even a riddle. But the point we need to draw from here is what might seem minimal, but it is the end result of the first two ingredients into saving a life or a nation. Listen, Daniel lived in a kingdom where what God had done in his grand, or uh, Belshazzar lived in a kingdom where what God had done in his grandfather's life had been proclaimed to the whole kingdom. We know from chapter four, one to three, that Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. And then the king said, after his mind was restored and kingdom restored to him, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now remember, this is the 16th of Tishri, 539 BC, 23 years after Nebuchadnezzar had died and Belshazzar had been co-regent for some 14 years. Yet, it seems pretty unlikely that he had not ever met the man who his grandfather promoted as the head of all the wise men and one of the governors over the entire kingdom of Babylon. And of course the kingdom talked about the king's seven years of madness and the decree uh, that he had made in worshiping and recognizing the God of Daniel just 23 years earlier. Now that's about as unlikely as somebody 30 years of age like Belshazzar is here, not knowing that we ever landed on the moon. It is not possible that he didn't know who Daniel was. He was simply demeaning Daniel with how he addressed him. Now, he said he'd heard of Daniel, but again, it's not likely it was only by the queen mother. Now, Daniel was ahead of the lords who were at this orgy, and he knew who Daniel was, but it, is, it appears as though he also knew what Daniel stood for. Now, what that tells us is that because of a lust for pleasure and a distaste for righteousness, he had, Belshazzar had, rejected God's authority and also, therefore, had no respect for the people of God. Now, this gives us our third component of how to save a nation, and it's just simply this. Listen, if we're going to see our nation turn around, then we must promote and protect proven divine truth. We must promote and protect proven divine truth divine truth. Has our nation been blessed? Does our nation have a rich heritage of honoring God? Is that why our nation has been blessed? Absolutely. And we need to continue to promote and protect our own history as a country. And it's clear that Belshazzar's attitude was, nothing's going to happen to me. I can ignore what my grandpa said and believed all I want. And my behavior is not going to have any consequences, no matter what it was that happened to him. And I think we all know someone who has walked away from what they once said they would die to defend, and they act like all they have ever read or heard is now irrelevant to their lives. And many times, they even become enemies of what they once believed. Now, how do things get to such a point in a person or a nation? Pursue pleasure over righteousness is the first step. Reject God's authority, and the next thing you know, you're ignoring things you know that are indisputably true. And forgetting what God has done in the past is never a good thing. In 2 Timothy 2, 3-4, we're reminded that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine 
but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, we're seeing that happen today, are we not? People are turning aside to things that are simply human inventions, and they use much of the language that is incorporated in Christianity or found in the Scripture. But I find it interesting as we look to our world today and see the things that are happening, the transition and the digression that our nation is experiencing, that less than a hundred years ago, men like Billy Sunday preached in this country and hundreds of thousands of people came to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And here we are, scrapping and scraping and fighting, even in, uh, amongst ourselves as the church, seeking to see people come into the kingdom of God. Listen, we need to reach out and seek to save our country. People are perishing in our land. Amen? Twice in our country's brief history, we're a baby as it, uh, uh, compared to other nations of the world. But twice in our own country's history, there were such radical moves of God that people around the world refer to them as the Great Awakenings. Our country has seen people come to know Christ by the tens and hundreds of thousands in different periods of our brief history, our less than 300 year history. Yet here we are a short span of time away. And even in our own recent history, we have the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s where tens of thousands of people were saved right here in Southern California and around the world. So we're in the same nation that saw two great awakenings in the Jesus movement, yet today, you're not a fool if you believe in evolution, you're a fool if you don't. And that's the world we live in today. That's where our nation has gone. We need to seek to save our nation. And we need to therefore protect and promote proven divine truth. The word of God stands fast in the heaven. Somebody say, amen. amen. Now, let's look at 17. Uh, to 23. We're almost done, so hang on. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all his ways, you have not glorified. Now please note how careful Daniel was not to be offensive and maintain political correctness. Pretty bold statements before the king, and first of all, he's not being disrespectful when he tells the king to keep his gifts. He's just saying, listen, I don't need your money. I don't need the prestige in order to interpret the writing on the wall. I'll do it for you for nothing. But he doesn't tell the king what the handwriting means right off. He first makes a case for all the things that the king knew and had ignored. He recalls the events of Nebuchadnezzar's life and where and what it led him to, to recognize that the most high rules among men. Daniel then says to Belshazzar, but you, his son, or his grandson, you haven't done what Nebuchadnezzar did. You didn't acknowledge God. You challenged him. You rejected him. You mocked him. The very God whom your grandfather proved holds everyone's breath in his hands and owns everyone's ways, and you have not given him glory. 
Daniel is making his closing arguments before he pronounces the sentence. Belshazzar had worshipped pleasure. He had rejected God's moral authority. He even questioned God's very existence by his actions. He ignored the evidence all around him of proven divine truth. And Daniel's accusation here is our fourth component of how to save a nation. And that is simply this. Here's what we need to recognize in our country today and always. Listen, remember, living without the fear of the Lord will always lead to destruction. Remember, living without the fear of the Lord will always lead to destruction. And Belshazzar is in a dangerous place for any person or nation to come to. To be so self-righteous and prideful that they think they can party with the enemy right outside the city walls. And thus say in their own minds, oh, that's not going to happen to me. There's not going to be any consequences for my actions. I always shudder even today when I hear statements similar to those from those who abuse the grace of God today. Who say things like, I can do what I want and God will forgive me. They often say things that sound just like that. Yet, Jeremiah had warned the Jews of impending disaster because of their perversity, because of their idolatry, and because of them offering their children in sacrifice. And Jeremiah said, repent or there'll be consequences. The children of Israel said this in reply. Jeremiah 18, 11, and 12. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, That's hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. Now listen, when a person or a nation says, pleasure is my goal, pleasure is my God, there is no authority in life but my own perception and definitions of truth. When all God has done in the past is ignored, the only possible ingredient that will then be added to a person's life or a nation's life will be they lose the fear of the Lord. And they live and act like nothing is going to happen to them, no matter how they live. And they lose both the fear of the Lord and the fear of consequences for their actions. Well, what's the remedy? Well, remember that while God is love, he is also righteous. He is also holy. He is also just. Now, this is the closing argument. And Daniel now pronounces sentence. Look at 24 to 31. And we'll wrap up our time together here tonight. 24. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsen. This is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now Daniel interpreted the meaning of the words, but a direct translation would simply be meaning numbered, meaning numbered, Tekel, Wade, Eupharsin, divided. So what was written on the wall, it wasn't that it was unreadable. It was written in Aramaic. The Chaldeans didn't know what it meant because all that was written on the wall was numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. And therefore Daniel was able to give the interpretation and meaning of the words. Now in Psalm 90, 10 and 12, 10 to 12, we're told the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow for it is soon to be cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger for as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Numbering our days simply means to make them count. Now the repeating of the first word, meaning, Meaning, numbered, numbered, seems to imply that the Lord had already been speaking to Belshazzar. As he tells him, he has basically been numbered or counted twice. Now, 
Doesn't that sound like the Lord? Aren't you glad he's the God of second chances? Third chances? Fourth chances? He gives us the opportunity and time to repent. God is always first merciful and long-suffering. And then when a patient and continual calling to repentance is rejected, and God therefore is rejected, and repentance never comes, like Belshazzar, he is told, your days are numbered and your number is up. The kingdom has been given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, when pleasure's natural balance becomes perverted, and God's authority rejected, and proven divine truth is ignored, and then you encounter the greatest danger to any person or nation. And the only way to turn that nation around is simply this. And here's the cure for any nation, including ours. And it's simply this. Here's number five of our observations. Listen, repent and submit to the will of the Lord. That's the only hope for our country or any other or any person. Repent and submit to the will of the Lord. I'll wait for you to say amen. amen. Daniel says to Belshazzar, your number's up. Your days are over. They've been counted, and your life has been wanting. Now, if you or I heard those words, that we had erred exceedingly and played the fool, and our life was weighed in the balance and found wanting, I would hope that the first thing we would do would be to cry out to God for mercy and repent of our worthless living. I would hope that's what we would do. Amen? But how strange, or weird even, to put a robe on Daniel and a gold chain around his neck and make the decree that this Daniel is now third in rank in the kingdom. So what's that tell us? It tells us Belshazzar didn't believe what Daniel said was actually going to happen. But little did he know, as history now reveals, this impregnable city of 350 foot high walls with an endless water and food supply was about to be breached. King Cyrus was actually upriver from the city and they had diverted the flow of the Euphrates River and they walked under the 350 foot high walls of Babylon right into the city and were told by historians that Babylon was taken without one single spear being thrown. We might even say the city was taken without a single shot being fired. And on that October night in 539 BC, a man who had ignored the five steps to saving a nation and did the opposite of them all, not only lost his own life, but he surrendered the greatest empire that had ever existed, and that being according to God's own description. Darius the Mede was on hand to accept the surrender of the kingdom and render the death sentence to Belshazzar. The collapse of the greatest kingdom the world had ever seen was complete all because of the actions of one man. Which reminds us that our topic tonight is both personal and national. Now, it made me think of the words of Thomas Jefferson that he said back in 1781. He says, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You ever wonder what the founding fathers would say if they saw our country today? You ever wonder how they would feel if they saw the things going on, the perversion that is happening in our country, the slaughter of innocent children in the womb, and the myriad of other things that are going on in our country? You ever wonder what they would say if they saw what was happening? Well, you know what? I think I know what they would say. I think they would say what John the Baptist said. I think they would say what Jesus said. I think they would say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. After all, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 reminds us that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their what? Wicked ways, there's repentance. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, the end result being what? And heal their land. Our country needs healing. Amen? Our country needs healing. Time is short. Jesus is coming. And I hope that the reason that the United States of America is unmentioned in biblical prophecies that pertains to the last days is because the rapture removes the vast majority of the population here in our country. That's what I hope what happens. Amen. Come on, that's worth something. Now, that means the steps to save our nation have to be taken. 
And the responsibility, again, is given. I always find it interesting that as the answer to Solomon's question, at the dedication of the temple that he had built for the Lord, he prayed to God in Second Chronicles and said, what if your people start worshiping idols? What if they become immoral? What if they turn from you and follow after other gods? And God responded by saying, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from my wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, the reason I think that's important is because it places the responsibility of the healing of a nation on God's people. If God's people would be and do what God has called them to do and be, then the nation is going to experience the blessings of that. After all, that's where we started with men who loved and honored the word of God. And our nation experienced two centuries plus of great blessing because of our foundation. Well, listen, there's hope for our country today. And repentance is the only hope for healing our land. Not politics, not policies, only repentance and submission to the will of God can make our nation or any other a nation that it ought to be in the eyes of God. And all God's people said together, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for this scene recorded in Daniel and the insights that we were able to glean from it, God. And we do pray for our nation. And Lord, um, this nation is doing things that are an abomination to you. And while we may enjoy a season of an upward economic turn, God, that's not what the real blessing is for any nation. We are a blessed nation when we treat you as the Lord. So Father, I do pray for our country. I pray for your church in this country, that we would be that which we are supposed to be, that purifying and preserving influence in a country where pagan rituals and practices are being protected and promoted even by the government. But Lord, may we be like Daniel, non-participants in the things that are displeasing to you. And may we be like Daniel, able to speak the truth in love so that others may come to know you. Help our country not to be filled with Belshazzars in high offices, but rather Nebuchadnezzars who see that the most high God is the only one worthy of praise. We pray for our country. We again lift up those in Florida who are in crisis tonight and mourning the loss of their children or spouse. We pray for them. We ask God that you would comfort them, strengthen them, be near them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen. Well, once again, take a look at Philippians chapter 4. Read 4 to 9 for uh, Sunday morning, and we'll spend our time looking at reasons to rejoice once again. So with that said, would you all stand? You need are you listening? I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him, these hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I felt.